Achtung, Achtung. And this time, well, we really mean it. Uh, today is August the 25th. And 80 years ago tonight, um, uh, the RAF bombed, the Berlin, Berlin, bombed Berlin for the first time. How about that? Did they find it, though, James? Did yeah, they, they find did. They just, about, they just about did. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't terribly effective. But there is this brilliant photograph you can see of uh, from 1940 of streets being cleared of rubble. Yeah. And um, you're first thinking, oh, yeah, London. OK, yeah, obviously, Blitz and all the rest of it. But not a bit of it. It's Berlin. It's Berlin. Berlin bombed four times before Hitler authorised the Luftwaffe to attack London. Yeah. So that was yeah. just the first. So it was the night of the 24th, 25th. And of course, very embarrassing for the very embarrassing for the uh, the Nazi government. Incredibly yeah, and, um, and everyone had to call Goering Meyer from there on. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, OK, over the course of the war, the RAF, with a little help from the Soviet Navy and the USAF, pounded the city so badly that 1.7 million people became refugees. Did it help us win the war? I don't know. It's open to debate, but I know a man who, who, who does. James Holland is back from the Reich. <laughs> His ship docked from Lisbon over the weekend. He lost much of his baggage walking over the snow-tipped hills of northern Spain. But, dear listener, he's here. I am, um, and brown, I'm quarantine-free. Browned off and bloody-minded. How are you, how are you James? Yes. Oh, that was a hell of a trip from um, Zarbrook to the Channel Tunnel, and I can tell you, without stopping, you needed long-range tanks for that one. How long did it take? Well, uh, it took about four hours, 20 minutes. It's 330 yeah. miles, but... Fortunately, particularly that stretch along Verdun, um, yeah. was very, very empty. So with my right. eagle eye scanning for potential French police cars, I put my foot down and you went for it. Put your foot down. Yeah, okay. I was I as mean, fast as Rommel. When I when I when I say when I say um, you know, as long as you don't stop, you're all right. The, the the main question that came back to me is, how do they know you haven't stopped? Well, okay, so this is the thing, okay, because literally as we were getting close to Harzerbrook, and I was thinking of you at that mm. point. Yeah, you know. Daisy in the back was sort of going, oh, I really need a pee. And, and you know, we thought, okay, well, we've only got another kind of, you know, 60 kilometres to go. Um, yeah. You know, can you hold on? Uh, yeah, OK. You know, it's all getting increasingly tense. Yeah. And I said, yeah. well, look, I'm sure, you know, we could just pull off, go go through the payage, find a little country yeah. lane, find a yeah. find a hedge, job done. Um, yeah. But we just kind of felt, no, we shouldn't do that because, you know, we've been told we shouldn't and we're, we're law-abiding citizens, obviously. Aww. So so Aww, we went for it. Good. And then we then get to Calais, get to the Channel Tunnel, pass all those sort of Calais Guy and Calais Mark, and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah we have, you know, Second World War, Luftwaffe fighter airfields, obviously. Um, <laughs> and you get to the Channel Tunnel, you go through French customs, that's all fine. Then you go through British customs, and it's like, are we allowed to get out and have a pee now? I'm like, yeah, no problem at all. And they said, where have you come oh. from? And I went, Zabrakan, we did it without stopping. We didn't get out once. We didn't even go to a garage. We didn't have a pee. And I went, great. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. Oh, God. Oh, and that was God. it. No one's oh, checked on us. Me. You know. Uh, well, well, you know. You know. What can you do? So presumably, what, if, what you, you, if you want to go for a pee and you want to get out and all the rest of it, you, you know. Then you, you might as well. Oh, well. well, now then, time for some news, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Firstly, thank you to the 502nd Independent Company members. Uh, oh, sorry, I read that like they were, like they were a parachute regiment. From the... <laughs> uh, firstly, well, thank you to 500... Ways. Well, they in many ways, ways, thank you to the 502 Independent Company members who bought James's new book from us. Yeah, thank we'll you. We'll both be signing them. Yeah, it's amazing. We'll both be signing them as soon as they arrive from the printers and we'll post them first class the same day. That's incredibly exciting. Yeah. And while we're on books, 162 of you bought our August recommendations through the discount deal with Waterstones. We hope you enjoyed them. We've got three more recommendations ready for September. They're not available on discount until the 1st of September. But just to warn you, to tee you up, for you to create space on that bookshelf behind you, they will be the paperback of James's Normandy 44, which is out in a week's time. You've probably read it, but just in case. So He's first a little bit of different September, from the hardback. A little bit different from the hardback. Yes, a little bit different from the hard. The odd tweak here and there. Um, the Allies still win, though. Um, uh, it hasn't <laughs> changed do. the ending. They certainly do. <laughs> it's not like a director's cut with a different ending. No. Um, uh, the Ship by C.S. Forrester, if you enjoyed mm. The Good Shepherd or the recent Tom, ha- Tom Hanks Love film Greyhound. Book which was based on the book Don't Miss the Ship. It's set in the Med as a convoy tries to get through to Malta, and it's a cracking read. And our third choice will be Dan Todman's Britain's War into Battle, this first book which deals with uh, 1937 to 1941. And, uh, Dan was a guest on the live stream on Thursday night. Um, he was he was great, and what was really lovely is all the people saying, I've got to watch this again so I can keep up or take it all in. <laughs> I was getting a lot of that on Twitter. <laughs> I need to watch this again because it's this, this, my, there was just so much in it. I mean, I... I, I, I did love how um, 
wide ranging it was. I absolutely loved though. Um, the thing that, that's really stuck in my mind is uh, when I said, "Well, you know, uh, did the British establishment have anyone else l- that could have done Churchill?" Oh yeah, and he's like, yeah. And he's went, "Yeah, tons." He said, "Yeah, tons." I'm not sure about that. Like it, like it was the most stupid question imaginable. And, yeah, and I'm not sure is, I agree with Dan on that. Well, I thought. Well, I just, I just, like who? you know, it is really refreshing to hear someone say because, because otherwise, otherwise, the, 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 otherwise, it really is. But for one man, and in fact, the point you make an awful lot is, it's the, the, the entire system is geared to winning yeah. this kind of thing. Yes, and and is I don't is, think it would have made any difference to the outcome of the war, but I think you know what you, I just. I do think in that summer of 1940, when when he wins that battle of the war cabinet, and then yeah, wins the over the wider the cabinet, I think, I think he, he, work, he yeah. is the glue that kind of brings it all yeah. together and um, yeah. provides vision. I, I just think vision is so important in these scenarios. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but it's just, I just loved it. He went, yeah, tons. I know, amazing. amazing. And you're like, oh, well, I still okay. don't know quite who. But... <laughs> But then, you know, Truman did quite... You know, Truman... I, I don't think there's many critics of Truman, are there, when he took over no. the Well, well but the, the point he was also making is that when, when people poo-poo Eden, it's because of Suez. Yes. And if you... You know, he hasn't done that yet. You know, uh, yeah, you, yeah. You, you can, you, if you can extract that from your view of him, um, uh, which is, after all, what you're meant to do as a historian is, is, is go back to then rather than via yeah. um, uh, the other things they did later in their life, as it were. Yeah. I mean, it's... it's uh, I, I mean, I absolutely loved it, and um, and to uh, you, of course, you know, Short Valley Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah there's something, but, the, but there is something fantastic though about having um, someone who's an academic like that on, um, who who you could say, well, tell me about this, and he and he, you can see him sort of, you can see him. He's either got it right at the front of his mind, or he has a little rummage. Pulls it, pulls it out. It was just, yeah. it was just fantastic. Well, it's quite and interesting because I, I, I was talking to him the next day, and um, yeah, uh, and he was saying actually he found it quite an interesting experience because he's going to have to do quite a lot of this sort of thing, in, in, yeah, in teaching, yeah. And and he said, you know, do you, did I did we think he got the tone right? I said, absolutely spot on. Oh yeah. god, he completely, <laughs> he completely nailed, nailed it. it. Yeah. yeah, and and I thought. Um, I mean, the, the other thing I th- think that's really, really interesting is that idea that as you write something, you go into writing something with, your, with a view, and as you write it, your view can shift, mm-hmm. or you can come out the other end feeling differently about the subject. And I yeah. think that, that's really, really interesting, and I think a really interesting uh, thing about history, that, you know, that, 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 that there's this idea that there's just what happened, and it's set in stone, and all you've got to do is go and dig it out. It, it is, isn't really right. It, yeah. The... the, the that you know, I mean, I th- and he's very interesting about how his view on Churchill <clears throat> shifts. That interestingly, he's 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 not particularly interested in the story of Churchill before 1941, but the one after it, where the, where all the power relationships change, and Churchill has to think differently in terms of the changing power globally, and Britain's sh- rapidly shifting place, which changes really fast. Uh, basically, after D-Day, Britain's Britain's preeminence in the war changes really, really quickly, doesn't it? Once the Americans are fully committed in the European yeah. theatre. Britain's, you know, and Britain's the first country described as a uh, as a superpower in 1944. Yes. But then by 1945, it isn't anymore. And th- yeah, I think that's diminished. really, that's really, really interesting. Um, and he said, you know, he said before on the, when we had him on, uh, you know, BC before COVID, he said that, that that's the bit he's interested in is how Churchill handled that power and his yeah. view of it, which I, which I think, you know, is another way, again, another way of looking at it, because 1940 tends to dominate the story. Um, uh, it, 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 and you know, there's still five hard years to go, and five yeah, sure. hard years of very hard politics. Um, anyway, I, well, uh, I tell he you was the thing I find really interesting about all this, though, is is that you know, as a historian, it's 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 so good to be able to talk through stuff. And sometimes yeah. you can be you can be stuck here. You know, I can be stuck here in my little study, and I can be tapping away, and I can be reading stuff, and I can be thinking about things. But you know, it's quite solitary, and. Yeah. What's really good, and has always been very useful, I've found, is to articulate stuff. So you yeah. talk to people, you know, and I, I've, I've had a lot of sort of conversations with people like Jeremy Black and Peter Caddick Adams and Steve Prince, who we've had on before. Mm. You know, these are kind of old muckers. And now, obviously, you and I are doing all this as well. It's great yeah. to be able to articulate things, and it's great to get people like Dan Todman on. And yeah, well, okay, we've read his book and stuff, but actually to kind of chew the cud 
and, and yeah. kind of sort of you know and that's why you you know you and i used to do that didn't we, we were back in the day yeah, we used yeah. to sort of meet up in london have a few pints and talk war and stuff yeah. but as well as being interesting and and good fun it really does help you to get your thoughts and your 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 thinking about things in order and you know yeah. this isn't something that stands still it's not like i've got i've come to my conclusion about the second world war and and you know now from yeah. now on i'm a closed book i'm completely yeah. open to kind of new ways of thinking of things yeah. and actually well, one I mean, of the things I've, yeah go on well well it's well that's the interesting thing as well is that is that is that you know he the thing he's going to write about next is the is the um uh, v bombs, isn't it? That's he said. That's the next thing he's going to be writing about is the, yeah. is the effect of that bit of the war. And if, it, 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 you know, when people say, "Why are you studying the Second World War? Is it relevant?" Well, yeah, because that's about that's about drone warfare. Yeah, in fact, which is a, which is as current an issue as it possibly could be. Yeah, and what the effect of drone warfare is on the people on the receiving end of drone warfare, which in the evidence for the Second World War is it makes them absolutely crazy for killing the people that are doing that to them. Yeah, so. So, you know, if, if if history, you know, and obviously lots of historians don't like the idea that there are lessons in history because it, they don't want to get pinned down into that sort of, you know, parable telling use of history. But if you want to, if you want evidence for what happens if you use drone warfare, the Second World War offers it to you yeah. in in, in yeah, glorious yeah. technicolor, yeah. you know, and I think that's the other. Uh, and but but as you say, chewing the cud and finding those things is the is is the other really interesting thing. It just joins it together. I mean, you know, and one of the other things when we were talking about government reaching in and uh, uh, rationing after the war, and, and and me saying, you know, it's government reaching in, and people don't like it when government reaches in. It goes, yeah, but at the same time, people want a health service where the government does everything for them in terms of their yeah. health. Yeah, and you think, well, yeah, but so what you've got there is the classic distinction, isn't there, between people want government mm. to give them stuff, but they don't want government coming in and taking it off them, and yeah. and 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 that that's thrown into relief yeah, by yeah. the war. I mean, it's just it, it, like you say. It's just so. It's just so interesting to talk about it. And reading the reading the books is great, but also to have someone of, you know, that caliber. And he's he's become part of the public debate with that book as well about yeah, the he? Second World War stuff. Yeah, which is really yeah. cool. Well, so, I think it's great that we're, and I think it's great that 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 things are shifting. That kind of narrative, yeah. that that sort of, you know, the kind of declinist t- kind of take on the Second World War, which has had such a firm grip for such a long long period yeah. of time. You know, the other thing I've, I've been, you know, I've been to quite a lot of work, work last week or so on 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 the Navy and how they, they set yeah. up at the beginning of the war. And it's just so interesting because I just think the Na- Royal Navy is just completely taken for granted in the Second World War. You know, the, yeah. all the debates about Britain's performance in the Second World War nearly all relates to two things. Should, should they have been doing strategic bombing? And the quality of the army and whether they had yep. good tanks or crap tanks and all the rest of it. And, and I think that, that, you know, the British army is certainly sort of comparable with the other major combatant armies. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the navy is really, really good. Really good. It's, it's exceptional. You know, we were talking the other day, weren't we, about that one shot from HMS Ajax on the, on yeah, the guns yeah. at Long Sumer. And, uh, you know, but from gunnery to seamanship and all the rest of it. So... I've been looking into all this, and and you know, if in the interwar years, if you were an officer, you would have basically mm. done six to seven years of training before you become an officer. I mean, I, really? I literally cannot think of a single service anywhere in the world that is quite so rigorous because you you would go off to Dartmouth at eleven. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so okay. So, um, how much training as an infantry officer, an infantry subaltern had, an army su- subaltern had? That's six months. Right. Okay. So yeah, for, for direct comparison, and then the air force is similar, right? It's like nine months. Right. Did okay. you get to so, ATU? Right. So, so but, years. Yes. Okay. So, so you could, and then you can have. There's a a, a, a thing called a um, uh, what's it called? A select entry. Okay. This is something yeah. they introduce in the. So you can be a, you can you can get a regular commission without having gone to Dartmouth first, which is basically yeah. a public school, but yeah, 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 you yeah. start at eleven, not thirteen. Yeah. Uh, and you go through to 17 and at 17 18 you'd become a a, a midshipman but all yeah. through that time you do you do your classics and your maths and french and english and all the rest of it but you'd also do vast amounts of training and vast amounts yeah. of stuff on ships and stuff and discipline and blah 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 yeah. and entry into dartmouth was absolutely not a given at all you know it was a lot of people were kind of rejected 
Yeah. So so entrance to Dartmouth College is in Naval College is quite is quite hard. <clears throat> then you have your kind of you know from midshipman you're on ship you're doing practical training which is very like the kind of sort of Yarn uh, Junker that system that they had in in German offices yeah. where you sort of have to go and kind of earn your stripes before you properly you know you have yeah. to do experience first in, in the front before you kind of become get properly commissioned and even if you're if you're a, um, a select entry you'd still do 18 months of training beforehand and then they they set up this thing called the um uh the Royal Naval Volunteers Re- uh, Re- Reserve um yep. uh, and they have have a sort of another version of that um which is the Royal Naval Volunteer Supplementary Reserve and those yeah. are the yachtsmen those are guys you've already got yachting stuff and you're encouraged to do that you you don't get paid for that that is entirely voluntary and you're also right. encouraged to do extra kind of coastal skippering exams and all the rest of it yeah which are pretty rigorous now and so this must this must be because ships are expensive and rifles and artillery pieces relatively are cheap that 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 it, it, you know the british state is spending an awful lot of money on the navy yes and and has done throughout and throughout even the even the times where it's not spending a great deal of money on defense so uh, although although actually interwar britain is still spending more on defense than anyone else but it's re- relatively relatively less than before than before the first world war right the, the, it's it's cuz ships are really 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 expensive isn't yeah. it so you need you need absolutely you need you need people with tons of training whereas a bloke leading another load of blokes up a hill to take a position yeah. that's all cheap that that soldiers are che- i mean this comes down to sh- soldiers and rifles and field guns are cheap a battleship is really, really, really expensive. bloody expensive. Well, I'd never thought of it like that, t- but I think you're probably right. But I think it's also because it's the senior service and because, you know, excellence and, and excellence of standard is just kind of part and parcel of, of what, you know, that is what the Royal Navy does. And I think it's yeah. just a, I think it's just the bar is incredibly high, which is why yeah. when they come up against the Italians and stuff in the in the Second World War, they absolutely trounce them pretty much every single time because they're just they yeah. are their seamanship is just so much better. And it's kind of to a certain extent the same same with the Germans as well, the Kriegsmarine. You know, that's why they're able to yeah. sink kind of, you know, six destroyers in uh, Narvik just like yeah. that. But I mean, you know, what's yeah. really interesting though is that, is that the regular force excluding Royal Marines is 9,762 officers and 109,170 men in January 1939. Right. Obviously, it kind of expands right. a bit over the, over, the, over the summer of 1939. But that's not, yeah. you know, that's like 110,000 strong in total yeah. in the whole Navy, you yeah. know, the senior service. So, uh, do what, what is also, go on. To do global force projection all over the world it's only 120,000 people yes but but that just goes to show doesn't it what what um, a force multiplier it is in terms of yeah, kind yeah. Of, of, of military prowess and, and force and what a practical yeah. way of de- dealing with it because okay so your battleships cost an absolute shitload but 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 actually the number of men you need for it what is also really interesting is that uh, at the start in summer of 1939 and early part of the war no one wanted to join the army for obvious yeah. reasons, because of the kind of legacy yeah. of the First World War and stuff, everyone wanted yeah. to join the kind of RAF, and the RAF ab- advertising campaign was just completely stupendously good. Um, yeah. Uh, but by 1943, um, uh, volunteers, uh, people who are applying for the Navy, is outstripping the RAF by two to one, and by 1944, really? it's three to one. Wow. Yeah. I wonder why. Because I it's wonder seen. What's going it's on there. seen. It's perceived. As the number one service to be in, the one with the greatest credibility. No one wants to die being in a bomber over over no. Stuttgart, uh, and it's seen as glamorous. And the, and the other thing that I, you know, because I was always saying, well, I think that's probably one of the safest things to be. But but you know, I, I've I've been sort of looking at this book by Brian Lavery, and, and he points out that actually um, the navy is in, in many ways the most dangerous because you know four four uh, four out of five people in uniform. Aren't ever seeing any action whatsoever in the Second World yeah. War in the British in the British Armed Forces. You know, most yeah. most people are kind of spending from 1940 to 1944 in England training in yeah. the army, yeah. not doing anything. Vast majority yeah. of people in the RAF aren't aren't seeing any action because they're aircraftsmen, they're kind of you know yeah. fitters and riggers and bomb loaders and all that kind of stuff and yeah. admin stuff. You know, it's it's very it's a very, you know it is it's I think it's for every seven seven men in a Lancaster, there's 48 on the ground. 
Yeah. You know, um, and, and it's only the Navy that go off to war and they're at war literally the whole time. Incredible. Yeah, isn't it? It's just, and it's just well, again, it's just one of those things that I've just, I've suddenly, it's just like completely opening my eyes to... But it must be, it must be because shit, I, I'm, I, I'm really churn, churning this in my head now, this idea of why you, why you spend uh, basically a decade getting someone together as an officer for the Navy. And it must be because ships are really, really bloody yeah. expensive. And if you gave, if you gave a, if, you know, if you put a bloke who'd had six months training in charge of, <laughs> potentially in charge of a, of a frigate or a cruiser or a destroyer, he's not going to be, he's just not going to be up to it. And that yeah. you need you need people who've gone all the way through the whole thing, because because obviously navigation and stuff like that and how a ship handles has to be completely second nature, just a yeah. just a reflex yeah. to these people rather than oh I've got to get out got to get out my map because because often in the army it's somewhat you know you some people are really great at map reading and and everyone knows it and other people you don't give them a map whatever the circumstances and you're not going to get that in the navy if people have been have been through so much training and, yeah. and uh, 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 God, how interesting that is! Yeah. Incredibly, yeah, interesting. yeah, it really is. And 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 you know, and I've, I've been talking about officers, but the ratings training is also really, really good. I mean, yeah, second to none, really. Yeah, yeah. We're going to take a short break now. Uh, we'll be back in a second with more of this kind of stuff. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk, the Second World War podcast with uh, me, Al Murray, and James Holland. Uh, James, who's recently escaped from Deutschland, took the Freedom Trail on the Channel Tunnel. Um, uh, easier than it used to be. He didn't have to trek over the Pyrenees um, <laughs> with, the, with the Gestapo hot on his heels. Um, uh, oh, that, that, uh, the thing you said earlier on about the, the, the two things when people talk about the Second World War and the UK's performance is, is the area bombing, does it work? What was the other one? Oh, just about the army sort of being a bit rubbish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, you know, well, yeah but you know what? But you know what? But you know why area bombing mm. is the thing that people have got hung up on? It's because it's a cold war. That's a cold war interpretation of the Second World War. Yeah. Because after all, the threat in the Cold War was lots and lots of area bombing, basically. Yeah. So the so the debate has to go back again and again and again to does that work? Is it worth it? In order to say that nuclear deterrence doesn't work, which is also why I think people toss in that idea that the Americans used the atom bomb in the, in 45 to deter the Russians didn't work see doesn't work and all that sort of stuff and I think those are those are ahistorical uh, ways of looking at it they're filtered back through the yes. Cold War debates about yeah. how you conduct about how you conduct war but it also know, actually, but it also fits into the narr- into the declinist narrative doesn't it yeah, yeah. you know we all There's we were a, doing is this and it was uh, and you know we kind of thought we were morally on the moral high ground yeah. but what a waste of time and we just killed lots yeah. of civvies and all the rest yeah, of it yeah. i mean i've i've got to say you know i i'm i'm pretty convinced that the strategic air campaign was was a pretty effective and pretty good use of resources yeah. we had at the time yeah yeah. Right. OK. Now, um, a reminder to our listeners that Ross Carter's book about his time with the US Airborne is available for free on the independent company site on our Patreon. Those Devils in Baggy Pants is beautifully read by the American actor and great friend of the podcast, Chaz Mina. Right. Now, it's been a while since we got in stuck into some of your emails at um, there on the We Have Ways podcast at Gmail. If you want to get in touch, if you're elderly. OK. From Lewis Mitchell. <laughs> um, Lewis says, hello, Alan James. Um, it doesn't relate to whether he's sending this to um, from an old people's home. I'm currently reading a book from the Schweinfurt Regensburg raid, and it raised a question I would like to ask. The in, those infamous series of raids. Um, uh, I would like to ask, did German bomber crews have a tour of duty system like the Americans and the British, or did they just simply carry on flying missions until death, capture or injury? Love the podcast, and please do keep up with the brilliant book recommendations. Kind regards, Lewis. Well, I suspect he's reading his Martin Middlebrook, I'd have thought. Yeah, I expect so. That's the classic. The classic. Uh, the, the, all those, mm. all the, all of his um, a bomber campaign uh, accounts are they're well worth a read. Although when I went to when I went to Hamburg recently, I got the Doug the Hamburg book out, and um, uh, he kind of says, "Oh, Hamburg was Hamburg didn't really like the Nazis. They weren't kind of weren't into it, and the and the Gauleiter, although he was a loyal Nazi, wasn't really." He sort of think this this got a tang of the eighties where people are trying to go. It's all right. It, that, don't worry. Have about you it. have you read Keith Lowe's book on on Hamburg? No. no. Oh, that's really good. He's really actually he's someone we should get on. 
Yeah, we should. He's really yeah. good. He's really, really yeah. interesting on the kind of all the post-war stuff and also the legacy of the Second World War and how we yeah. view it and everything. Really, really interesting. Yeah, that he God, we should definitely get him on. He he would okay. he'd he'd stir it up a little bit, I reckon. Okay. Anyway. Okay. But um, go on. To, to go back to Lewis's question. Um Yes. Uh, uh no, they didn't. It's really, really interesting. Um you know, so so take my, my Nazi friend Haya Herman, for example. So he's flown yeah. in Spain. Uh he then yeah. flies in Poland. Um, he yep. then flies against Norway. He then is involved in the Blitzkrieg. Um, he's then involved in the Battle of Britain, and he keeps going. And by middle of October 1940, he's already on his 99th bomber mission of the war. So that doesn't include what he's done in Spain. And and I'm, I think it's something like the 14th of October 1940, something like that. Middle of October. Hell. He they- is taking off from, from Schiphol, um, outside Amsterdam, and RF come over and attack the airfield a bomb you know a splinter from an exploding british bomb um yeah. sh- uh, shreds one of his 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 undercarriage tires he slews off crashes con- you know knocks out knocks himself out wakes up yeah. 2 days later uh, in his hospital bed and uh, on his bedside table is is his knight's cross and he looks at it and goes oh. what's this and he goes, don't you remember, three days ago, um, Goering himself presented it to you, and he bursts into tears. And he is the toughest man ever. He's com- absolutely just yeah. completely spent. And you yeah. see, so what, what the Luftwaffe do is they just, they do give people leave, but it's but it's not. There's nothing regular about it. So, so yes, it's all, go, ar- it's all arbitrary. Isn't it's it? arbitrary. It, so it, sometimes it's like, okay, well, the weather looks bad this weekend, so you can have you can have two days off in Lille or whatever, or yeah. you know, um, uh, or yeah, I think it's time you had a little bit of time out, so go go home for a couple of weeks or whatever. But it's yeah. all, as you say, it's completely arbitrary. And, and one of the reasons why the Luftwaffe is in such stuck by the end of 1943, beginning of 1944, is because they have. All their best pilots have been killed through, or or, or starting yeah. to get really badly treated through overflying. Yeah. And one of the things yeah. that I thought was so interesting about the Mackie Steinhoff diary that he kept over Sicily in that yeah. period of in, in in May, June, July, nineteen forty-three, is you can see that they're all absolutely, ap- just totally spent. They're completely yeah. spent. They they all need leave. They all need to just go off and recharge and they're, and they're just not given that opportunity whereas even yeah. from 19, 1939 you know Dowding commander of fighter command is absolutely insistent that they have you know 24 hours off every week 48 hours off every yeah. three weeks they have regular leave yeah. there is a kind of, sort of unwritten rule that you have you know you do tours of duty of about six months and then you get yeah. then you go off and you do your um, um instructing for a little bit then you go yeah. back on combat ops there are there are all sorts of exceptions you can apply and say i don't want to go on training i feel absolutely fine i'd like to another another tour please um very yeah. quickly in malta for example in 1942 british Re- rf recognized that, that that's particularly tough so the tour of duty goes down is cut to three months not six you yeah know. so they really really look after their pilots and that's why so many of the battle of britain aces and the aces from the fir- early part of the war are still around in in 1945 yeah, yeah whereas yeah, the germans yeah. they're they're literally gone it, it's just yeah. it's it's just appalling and, and if you ever you know, one of the books that we're hoping to be able to reprint, if we possibly can, is the Heinz Knocker book, I Flew for the Fuhrer. He's a, yeah. he's a Messerschmitt yeah. 109 fighter pilot. And it's just unbelievable what he goes through. I mean, he's, the- he's shot down someone like eight times uh, and he keeps getting injured and he goes back into the air when he clearly should still be in hospital, let alone kind of even, but, you know, definitely. But why? Why are they doing this? Why Why have they got this? Because this, they've obviously got this wrong. What's going on? What's the... What's the um, uh, because it, because it's mental weakness if you if you suffer from combat fatigue, you know it's, it's a, you know you're, you're you know the right but, the right, but, but why the right not, is so short of manpower that they can't afford to kind of right. these guys so they kids. can't afford to to to, to run proper leave they can't no. afford and to it, have it structured it's as simple as that that they're, it's as simple they're, as that. they're basically and, and it's and it's and it all goes back to the kind of you know the fear of where thinking which is either either the German people are strong enough and they have the will the yes will, will to power, power. To do yeah, it, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. it'll be the thousand year Reich or or they haven't they're too weak. And and, God, and and so combat fatigue is a sign of weakness. Now they, you know, on on a localized level within the German military, they they accept combat fatigue, but yeah. but but at a higher level, it is absolutely not accepted. Yeah, it's like pulling yeah, finger out and show I, be a real man. Because it's all super. Because it's because I mean the Americans, particularly the Americans. I mean on Malta, the you know we, we, it, you know in one man's window, for instance, we're reading that he he does have time to himself. And time away—that's evident. But there are times where they're pressed, and he's in the—he's in the plane, yes, kind of constantly. 
yeah. and and there's there's bits of there's bits of um, uh, Pierre Klosterman's book where he's in the aircraft constantly, and and they they don't seem to be getting a break, but 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 the, and the and the Americans, but the Americans in particular are rotating people, are making sure you're not you're not on ops all the time. Yeah. I mean, although I mean, when you think about when you think about what an operation is for, say, a, for, for bomber crew, like how complex the briefing is, how much stuff you have to take on board, the weather briefing, the target briefing, the the routing, that yeah. you know, it's it's a it's a it's a lot to to hand someone. Yeah. So obviously, if you're if you're taking care of them and looking after them, you're, they're they're gonna they're gonna last. Well, in theory, they're gonna last longer. Though, of course, the completely random element of what then happens to someone. You know, there's no guarantee that in the air war in particular, I think there's no guarantee in the bomber war in particular, there's no guarantee that experience saves your life. Um, uh, it, it's so strange and random. And uh, I think I think experience could it's, it's, experience gives you um, a, a greater percentage. There's no question about that. I mean, you're much more likely to kind of be able to pull through if you've done. You, yeah, but you've got you've got plenty of crews who are shot down on their last tour. On of course, last, yeah, uh, yeah, no, sortie, you can't get rid of the random nature of it of the violence. Yeah. But but there are certain things you can do through experience that you know that sixth sense or the rest of it. You, yeah. you you're that much more familiar with your Lancaster or your Halifax or whatever it is, so you know how to deal with 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 um, difficult situations better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are things you can do to kind of sort of mitigate against it. But but you're right. There's a there's certainly a there's massive no random element. To it. No yeah, guarantee yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah, no, absolutely yeah, yeah, not. Yeah. But I mean, you know, let's take for example Hans Joachim Marseille. He was arguably the greatest pilot that's ever been you know he shoots down 172 yeah. pilots they're all british nearly all british fighter planes as well every single one you know yeah. compared to the kind of 352 of bibby hartman you know which is all scored pretty much on the eastern front um yeah. marseille's done all done on the western front and you know it is absolutely clear in the summer of 1942 he is having a colossal mental breakdown it's yeah. absolutely clear his behavior what he says the way he's what he's doing He's going clearly just completely do lally, and yet he keeps flying. He keeps flying, and eventually yeah. he's, he's given a kind of sort of you know enemy one hundred and nine G, and the engine catches fire. He bails out, hits the back of it, breaks his neck. Yeah, and he's you know and he's he's brown bread. He's done. But you know with with with, with someone like Antoine Marseille, it's it's you know he'd have, okay. So it's just a, an engine failure that that does for him in the end, and and kind of a bad bailing out. But yeah. he would have almost certainly been killed anyway. You know, he, yeah. he's absolutely bunkered by the end. I mean, really yeah. in, in trouble. And you see this time and time and time and time again. These guys are utterly, utterly spent. And the situation has been made worse by the fact that, that that Hitler is blaming the Luftwaffe for a lot of the ills of, of you know, the turn yeah. and fortunes. And Goering is in turn blaming his pilots rather than yeah. going, this is a war that's lost and we need to get out of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, we can't win. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, obviously. Okay, now Stuart Galbraith asks, hi fellas, or says, hi fellas, loving the podcast, and yes, before you say anything, I'm 47, and an old fart, so I'm officially allowed to use email. Well, I'll speak for yourself, How many... I'm 50, and I don't consider myself an old fart uh, yet. I'm, I'm 52, and I'm on the cusp. How many um, <laughs> Bomber Command airmen died in training, either in the UK or in Canada? I'm guessing that it's not included in official titles of all those killed in operations in Bomber Command. All the best, and keep up the good work. I think it is. Well, I think I the fifty-five thousand. I think that does include that does include training deaths. I think so. Yeah, I mean it. it it's plenty though. Yeah. Um. Uh. Air accidents. Uh. uh it does it include training? Because for... at that point you're on training command, doesn't it? You know, bomber command deaths yeah. are, are when you're flying, but but lots of people yeah. are. Yeah. No, he says tried in training, doesn't he? Does say specifically training? Yeah. 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 It's a lot. It's a lot. It's an awful lot. Um, because because after all, these planes are dangerous, <laughs> yeah, aren't they? I wouldn't be surprised I mean, the, the, if it's sort of ten, fifteen percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're not, you know, we're we're not talking. Uh, there's no air accident authority or anything that any of that sort of thing. It's not commercial travel, so they've got to be careful of the passengers, is it? They, they. It, I mean, although bomber training was extensive, and you got lots and lots of hours and worked your way up through the types, didn't you? Yeah. And, uh, uh, you did. It wasn't like when you set off. Uh, um, uh, Hamburg or Lübeck or somewhere, that, Hamburg or Lübeck or somewhere that you you it was your basically your first go, was it? You you mm. you knew your way around the aircraft, but yeah, an awful lot of people die in training. Um, I mean, I'm I thinking know. about I'm, I I can't think of a single memoir I've read or interview I've done with a veteran who hasn't commented on the fact that someone yeah. during their training killed was killed. Yeah, yeah, went into a hill yeah. in Wales, collided, yeah. took off, landed yeah. badly, got yeah. lost, right yeah, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, engines carked out. That that yeah, whatever. 
Yeah, and and plenty and plenty in Canada as well. Yeah. I mean, is it, it? I mean, you know. But here we are comparing, comparing uh, the, these questions kind of are sympathetic to each other. You know, the Germans don't have somewhere like Canada to go off and train in and no. get their guy get their guys uh, act together. They don't have they don't have any of this sort of stuff at their no. disposal. Um, sending, I mean, pilots basically go they go away for a year essentially, don't they, to Canada to learn how? Yeah, to... it's on nine months or so, and then you add yeah. on OTUs and or heavy conversion yeah. units and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it is really interesting, you know. Certainly by by 1943, middle of 1943, you know, frontline um, pilots, certainly fight, fighter pilots, they're they're arriving at their frontline squadrons with about 350 hours in their logbook, yeah. whereas a German one yeah. is probably lucky if he's got 100. God, yeah, it's a right. total mismatch. Okay. Okay, um, Mark, Mark Roberts says, Hi, uh, Alan James. Loving the podcast and being a member of the independent company. Uh, a Battle of Britain question for you. Was there a directive across all of Fighter Command for the Hurricanes to attack the bombers and the Spitfires to attack the fighters? Or was this decided locally between squadrons? As it was dependent on what squadrons turned up in any particular area and what they faced, did it work? Uh, yeah, so this is all about rate of climb. Um, so the Hurricane's rate of climb is is much, much, much slower than that of a Spitfire. And the yeah. point with air-to-air combat is you want to get above your enemy so that you can manoeuvre yourself around the sky so you have the sun behind you. So yeah. when you attack, you can attack at an angle of your choosing um, and with the element of surprise and speed and with your enemy blinded. That's, yeah, yeah. that's the whole point. So the problem is, is that the, the single-engine fighters tend to kind of... Um, operate above the bombers they're protecting for the same precisely the same reasons so you want yeah. your own fighters to be above their fighters yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah. the only plane that can do that is the spitfire because it can climb much faster than a hurricane so it makes yeah. perfect sense for the hurricane to attack the bombers and for the spitfires to be given the role of of attacking fighters so yes that is absolutely accepted and agreed at that higher level of command however obviously there are moments, particularly in the early part of the battle in, in, in July and into the first part of, you know, in, into the main bit of um, uh, August before the, um, the attacks turn on London and stuff on the 7th of September 1940, that um, there's a lot, you know, the Luftwaffe are attacking with lots and lots of different formations all over the place hitting the airfields. Yeah. And so therefore it is much more localised so that you might well have have um, hurricanes going after after fighter planes and so on. And what you might do is you might send a squadron up and one flight might be heading up to, to, to intercept the fighter planes um, and another flight attacking the bombers, or something like that. Yeah. So so that is done on a... Those decisions are made on a much more sort of local localised level. Well, yeah, but those those attacks <clears throat> before the 5th of September are more sort of piecemeal, aren't they, anyway? So, yes, exactly that. So, yep. so, so, so um, uh, it's... Actually, actually, figuring out who's going where and what they are is more difficult. It's when it turns into fleets of fleets of bombers with top cover yeah. that that it, it's easier to it's easier to make those make those distinctions and vector people accordingly. I mean, the other point that I think is is also worth making is that uh, as the summer progresses, they get better at it. Yeah, that it's all it's all brand new to everybody. In um, uh, or, or, or I'm talking about fighter command here. The 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 and the systems that work with it is that the, the, it's all experimental in June, July, yeah. how you actually deal with aircraft arriving across <clears> the channel. And by August, it's it's a thing that's in practice. And sort of by by um, September, it's a technique. And, and, and the, 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 you know, the, 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 it evolves from a theory to a practice to a technique across that time, which means and also then the German tactics change, which actually plays into that um, uh, that development Right, um, with the observer corps and uh, with vectoring and with the central command system that the fighter command are running. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Say, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of things that change. So they start off with, you know, they're all taught these kind of six different types of attack. Yeah. Uh, you know, where you all sort of, it's all very kind of precise and, you know, yeah. uh, everyone in the squadron sort of peels off in a certain way and attacks at a certain angle and all the rest of it. And very quickly that realise, you know, they realise that that's just completely, that's absolute bullshit and, and won't work. Yeah. Um, and, and similarly, they ha- they've, got their um, machine guns aligned to kind of converge at a certain point and that's about 400 450 yards at the start of the battle of britain but by the end of the battle of britain you know there's not a single person who hasn't got it down to kind of you know maximum of 250 yards yeah you know so things are evolving all the time but yeah you're absolutely right about the um about you know the great thing about once that the luftwaffe turns to mass formations on cities then it's much easier to predict where those where those raids are coming you can see what's coming so so therefore it's much 
easier to organise your, your squadrons. So from the 7th of um, September onwards, Park in 11 Group and down south east of England, he rearranges things so that the squadrons are operating in pairs of squadrons, uh, a Spitfire yeah. squadron and a Hurricane squadron, and they'll both take off from the same airfield at the same time, with the with the yeah. Hurricanes going for the bombers particularly, yeah. and, the, and the Spitfires going for the fighter the escort. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Reese asks, well, says, loving the pod. I recently moved to Switzerland from the UK and listened to it nonstop on my drive down. God, God help you. My move, my move has led me to question why Switzerland remained free throughout the Second World War. He's got free and in inverted commas, by the way. Mm. Neutrality didn't, didn't stop the Nazis elsewhere. It was surrounded by Axis influence. And there's also significant German population in Switzerland. Why didn't the Nazis attempt to annex it like Austria in 38? And what do you think the outcome would have been if they'd tried? Were the defences of the Swiss Redoubt much of a deterrent to invasion? And would it have prevented total subjugation in the event of attack? Keen to hear your thoughts regards Charlie, not an old person. Yeah, we had a we had a, a similar thing about this, didn't we, not so long ago. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the Germans are very keen to invade Switzerland. I think they just sort of, you know, they have bigger fish to fry. They're going to get round to it. They were get round to it. They didn't get round to it, and actually, they were able to get everything they possibly wanted from Switzerland. There was also that whole thing about kind of, you know, it was quite a useful place to have a neutral place, which was quite yeah. friendly towards them in many ways, um, on their corner, uh, on their doorstep. You know, not least all the Zurich bank vaults. In fact, Hitler and Goering have still got got bank accounts in Zurich, um, yeah, uh, untouched since 1945. Um, yeah. So yeah, so the, there was a plan, um, and they just didn't didn't enact it because you know they didn't have time before the war started, and yeah. uh, Switzerland didn't want to be annexed, and then they, then it was France and it was the Soviet Union, and there were kind of a bigger fish. But, right. but if he'd done it, you know how he'd have done it, wouldn't he? He'd have he'd have started agitation about these Germans are German and they belong in Germany. They don't belong in Switzerland anymore. Yeah, yeah, they'll speak. And then he's lo- and yeah. then some local some local. Swiss Nazis would have said, "We're German. We want to be part of, of Greater Germany of the Reich," and they'd have done it. They'd have done it the way they did it everywhere. That, yeah, that, that it's exactly the same. Create Putin agitation in, in, in Ukraine and what he's probably yeah. gearing up to do in Belarus. Yeah, 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 exactly. But I mean, the the, the thing is, is I mean, guy, guy is guy Walters, who uh, we've spoken to a couple of times. He's he's pretty he's pretty. Uh, robust about this he doesn't think they were neutral exactly <laughs> does no. he he thinks that essentially essentially were on the side of the germans but couldn't couldn't actually be uh stayed out but were generally sympathetic yes he? and certainly that, if you were allied and, and you you ended up there you know if you're a bomber crew or something and you bailed out over there yeah. you'd spend the rest of the time rest of the war in a, in a prison yeah yeah, in a prison, yeah. Um, okay, uh, one more, I think. This is from yeah. Scott Pendry. Hi, lads, loving the podcast. A great mix of content, and I always take away a few nuggets of really interesting um, info after each episode. Well, that's that's what we're going for, so thank you. Yeah. Not sure if you've covered it already, but um, have you done much digging into the role of the RAF Special Duty Squadrons in delivering SOE and SIS operatives in France? I've just started reading We Landed by Moonlight, which is on my pile um, a first-hand account of what it was like to fly these missions, and it is fascinating stuff. These boys took their lives under into some very small and unprepared strips to drop off and recover agents, and I'm amazed there hasn't been more written on it. The Sebastian, Sebastian Falk's classic novel Charlotte Grey talks about these missions, but again, I'm surprised more books, movies haven't been made. These flights would make an epic movie. Well, I mean, th- th- it, it's an extraordinary story, and um, uh, the, 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 you, you, I mean, the thing is, the thing is, is... You, you can be pretty ambivalent about this stuff. How much it actually achieved is the truth. So how much attention you then give it, I think, uh, um, can can feed into into that. I mean, it's it's incredibly glamorous. There's no there's no doubt about that. That's yeah. I mean that's why that's why it's surprising there aren't more films about about this sort of thing. It's incredibly glamorous. The <clears> idea <throat> of landing an aeroplane, dropping someone off, picking someone up. It's it's sort of it's uh, a a a. a fascinating but but i i mean i don't really know anything about it at all like i say because i've not read the, i've not read the book that you've just started scott it's sat in my pile it's on my um heap of things i need to finish well, well they had the, they had these um they had these these special duty squadrons didn't they um yeah uh, one three eight i can't remember there was another one one can't remember what the second one was in in the uk yeah. touch bomber command then there was uh one four eight in the mediterranean um, and they were, you know, these are the ones that were doing doing this stuff, and and it was a mixture. So you would have Lysanders for actually landing, but you'd also have yeah. Halifaxes and things, and 
Um, Lots for, of Halifaxes and yeah, yeah for Sterling dropping and stuff. dropping all the all the containers and and all the rest of it. I mean, what is really interesting about it? I remember I did do this work on the um, looked into it in great detail about about what the um, what the SOE was saying they were delivering to the Italian partisans at the end of the war and what they were yeah. actually delivering to the partisans at the end of the war was quite different. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah. you can look on the ORBs, which is the operational record books, which is effectively the squadron diaries, and there it all yeah. is, and it says, says exactly what they're sending um, and <laughs> exactly how many drops they're making and how many containers are being dropped and all the rest of it. And, and yeah. it is, is surprisingly little compared to what is being claimed they're sending. Um, yeah. But, yeah, no, I mean, the, the, it, it is absolutely fascinating and required sort of, you know, nuts of steel to do it. Although, yeah. actually, I think for the most part... Um, you know, if you're dropping a Lysander, you know they're they're in a field that's 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 chosen specifically because it's quite remote. You know, the Germans can't be anywhere. They've only got like two hundred thousand troops in the whole of France, for example. Um, most of them are in towns. Um, you mm. know, there's very few German troops are wandering around the Maquis in the middle of the night. Yeah. So it it's is. It's, it's actually in a funny sort of way. It's sort of it's probably easier to do than you might imagine. Yeah. The White Rabbit is uh, uh, there's lots of that in uh, this in that account, isn't it? The yeah, there absolutely book, is. It? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. There is the the very the the, the, yeah. the, 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 the he one is is good though. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, yeah. We'll be back with our usual double bill on Thursday. Pod in the morning, live stream in the evening, uh, special live stream, and uh, in between making this pod and Thursday, we are going off to um, have a, a day. Uh, well, I won't tell you about it, but you're going to hear all about it. <laughs> you're going to feel quite green. Oh, you're going to feel quite jealous. Um, obviously, it will be a socially distanced day playing with tanks. Anyway, um, thank you for joining us. Yeah. Um, so we'll see you on Thursday for the live stream on Thursday evening. Uh, cheerio und auf Wiedersehen. Yeah, cheerio.